Nuriel, let's talk a little bit about AI. There's been a lot of hype around it. It's been a major driver of markets so far this year. Just about every company is mentioning the technology as much as they can uh, within their earnings reports. Uh, are you on this hype train? Is it helpful for economic growth? What do you see? Well, uh, eventually it will be helpful for potential growth, productivity, economic growth. But usually there are significant lags, you know. We had the first digital revolution in the 80s, and then we had the internet revolution in the early 1990s. But it was not until the second half of the 1990s, that was uh, between 96 and 2000, we saw a significant increase in potential growth and productivity growth from 2% towards 35 and so on. So it took about uh, 15 years for that to happen. So yeah, there is a lot of talk about technological innovation, AI, machine learning, robotic, automation, cloud uh, computing, and quantum computing, and you name it. But we don't see it yet in the aggregate productivity number. Productivity growth in the US has been barely 1%, slightly lower. Uh, will, in 10 years, are we going to see a significant increase in productivity? I'm quite uh, optimistic. I'm a productivity optimist and a technology optimist. But I think there are meaningful lags. And the idea there will be a surge in economic growth in the next two or three years because of AI and technology, to me, seems to be sort of far-fetched. At the time where actually there are many other forces that are negative aggregate supply shocks, including uh, deglobalization, decoupling, the risking, restriction to migration, uh, aging of population, geopolitical depression, climate change, cyber warfare, uh, global pandemics, and you name it. So there are many factors that actually are stagflationary that reduce growth and increase cost of production. In the medium long term, technology is going to be deflationary, but we might be facing a decade of stagflation before we see the bright light of technology and AI increasing growth and reducing inflation. Doctor, I need a drink after all that. <laughs> um, you know, even as we think about all of these risks, specifically as we're looking at that timeline for when productivity will ensue over these next two to three years, plus the longer term effect over the 10 year time span that you had laid out, where does, re where does regulation step in? Well, we know that we may need to regulate uh, AI because there are a number of side effects. Uh, one of them might be excessive oligopolistic or duopolistic concentration. The second one may be uh, misinformation and disinformation and affecting elections and other stuff. But there are other side consequences. You know, AI may increase the economic pie, but might lead to permanent technological unemployment, initially among blue collar workers, then white collars, and even some of the creative classes. And it might also increase income and wealth inequality because these innovations are capital intensive, skill buys and labor saving. So if you own the machines or the capital owns the machine, you do well. If you're in the top 10% distribution of skills, education of human capital, AI makes you more productive. But if you are a low value added or medium value added, blue collar and white collar, increasingly your job and income is going to be threatened by technology. So we'll have to have a bigger social safety net and tax the winners and then uh, redistribute the income to those who are left behind to address also the socioeconomic consequences of technology. So there'll be also these negative side effects that require intelligent types of regulation, of course. While we have you here, we're also looking to and perhaps through another major event that could greatly impact not only U.S. The economy, but the global economy. And that's the 2024 presidential election. It's already starting to ramp up. I would love to get your thoughts as you kind of game out what could potentially take place here and what impact it could have. Certainly that uh, political uncertainty is going to lead to policies and uncertainty not just policy uncertainty about economic policies. Of course, the economic policies of Trump would be very different from those of uh, Biden, but also the geopolitical consequences. Uh, you know, if uh, Trump had been in power this time around, I would say that Russia would already have taken over all of Ukraine and his policies towards uh, the Russia-Ukraine conflict are kind of, uh, we don't care about it. Uh, is he going to be more aggressive, even more aggressive than Biden 
on China, uh, possibly so. We have a cold war getting colder. We have to find a modus vivendi with China. Uh, if we escalate this conflict, eventually there could be, you know, a hot war. So there are both uh, differences in uh, economic policies, in taxation policies, in regulatory policies, but also in foreign policy and geopolitics. They're going to have a meaningful effect, of course, on the economy, on the markets. And overall, policy uncertainty is not good for the economy. Uh, Nurio, I want to ask you, with uh, former President Trump as the leading contender for the Re Republican Party, despite the allegations being levied against him, given where that stands and what could potentially happen, what does that do to the U.S. in terms of its superpower status? Um, well, I, I would say that uh, it, it challenges the superpower status of the U.S., uh, in a several dimension. Dimension number one is that uh, we need to cultivate our allies. And when Trump was in power, he had an attitude towards Europe that was uh, condescending, to say the least. He even spoke about being in favor of a breakup of the Eurozone and the European Union. Um, I'm not sure that he would have supported the expansion of NATO. I'm not sure that he would have supported uh, uh, being aggressive the way we are rightly are against uh, the brutal Russian invasion of, uh, of Ukraine. And his attitude has always been of causing up to dictators and not actually be friendly with liberal democracies that have to be our friends and allies so that we have not only hard power but also soft power. So I worry that uh, a Trump presidency first might lead to further divisions within our own country, more partisanship. There is even risk of, unfortunately, violence. But it's going to also divide the U.S. in terms of its own soft power relative to allies, relative to the global south, and relative to the world. That's a risk that we're facing. Just lastly, while we have you here, a lot of us coming off of what we saw last week, especially in the Northeast and the U.S., in the wildfires that took place in in Canada and ultimately really wreaked havoc on air quality here in New York and some other states as well. When we think about where BlackRock CEO Larry Fink has emphasized that climate plays a risk and the priority investors and business should kind of really kind of put out on investing in sustainable solutions, how, how much importance do you believe that these solutions play as, as an economic overhang as well? Well, it's clear that climate change is becoming worse and worse, and we need to do something about it. You know, the good news is there are some technologies that are showing promise. Uh, one of them, of course, is renewable, and we have to invest even more into wind and solar. A uh, second one is uh, carbon capture and sequestration. Three, over time, clean and then green hydrogen might become economically viable, and maybe over the medium term, the uh, killer uh, technology might be fusion that might allow us to create unlimited amount of energy at low cost with net zero emissions. Uh, but we have to invest into these new technologies. The good news is that the passage of the IRA is going to provide uh, hundreds of billions of dollars, some people say up to a trillion of dollars of incentives to invest into a variety of these uh, green, renewable, and other technologies that are going to be uh, accelerating the green transition we need. So things look pretty ugly, and we need to do more. But we do have uh, the technology and now the tax incentive to accelerate uh, this needed green transition. All right, we will have to leave it there. Always great to have you on. Our thanks to you, Nouriel Rabini, NYU professor emeritus for the Stern School of Business. We appreciate you.